All God's people said, Amen. Amen. I, think, I think everybody's happy enough. I ought to just let you go. I like you. He said, No. Ephesians chapter 4, turn there. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Again, I want to say I appreciate everybody praying uh, for me. <clears throat> and uh, just continue to do that. And um, pray for our church, pray for our ministries. Everything God has us to do, we want to, we want to follow the Lord, want to do what's right. This sort of goes along with uh, it's part of what I've been preaching and um, has to do with the truth versus lies. We're being told a lot of lies. Uh, if you believe what they call the mainstream media, um, you know, today at least in the world of the internet, there's, there are alternatives. You don't believe everything that you hear on CNN, CBS, even on Fox. You don't believe everything you hear on that stuff. And uh, sometimes we don't necessarily want to get all mixed up. National politics, world politics. But this is going to be a crucial year, and there's going to be a lot of battles fought this year. Very crucial. And, and there's going to be a lot of things said that are true, and a lot of things said that are not true. Some of, these, some of these liars are getting caught. The guy that led the lawsuit to embarrass Trump when he came in office is going to prison now. Because he, he was one of these sleazy lawyers and he used extortion to extort Nike shoe company and he could be going to prison for about 42 years. It's the kind of people with that we're talking about. And I know that it's not, you know, with everything that comes across the internet, it's not really possible to know exactly who's telling the truth on everything. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of, a lot of you know, we was talking about this coronavirus. Where did that come from? Okay. Did it just show up one day? Is it something by nature? I don't believe so. Okay. Is it some vast conspiracy? I don't know that either. Okay. But I know what the Bible says. I know that God promised he would use pestilences in his plan. That I know. That I believe. So who's in charge of letting this virus out? Did they have dirty tricks behind it? I don't know. But I know who's in charge of everything. And anything that I want to encourage you to do is what I've always told you to do. Get your Bible out. And read it. The truth is right there. Amen? Truth is right there. I asked this question. Um, is it P. Ridge? I said, raise your hand if you believe in UFOs. And almost nobody did. I said, okay, who in here is afraid to raise their hand, but they believe in it? Some people did. Okay? Just this weekend, a whole new blotch of articles coming out saying the government has... Stuff on UFOs, okay? Now, I don't believe in little green men from Mars. I do know what the Bible says about all this, and that's the key, knowing the truth. And when you know the truth, what does it do to you? Makes, he said it right, other people said it right, it makes you free, at least free here. Paul was never in bondage once Jesus saved him even when he sat in a prison cell he was free okay and there's something to that I'm going to preach another part of this this morning Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22 do you have your Bible open there say amen uh, let's see here let's pick it up in I don't want to overdo it uh, let's pick it up in verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Vanity is the make-believe world that you have created. That's not the true world. And all of this has to do not with 
worrying about the truth about somebody else, worrying about the truth about you. Okay? None of these sermons do I ever use as or want you to use as a license to go on the attack on somebody else that you don't like, somebody you think is lying or somebody that you think is not being honest or whatever. This is for you first. Seek ye first. Pull the splinter out of your eye first. Get your own house in order is what the Bible says. So he says, don't walk in the vanity of your mind. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Lies are always ignorance. And believing lies, sometimes they can be done in ignorance, but the only thing worse than ignorance is willful ignorance. Where you believe something to be a lie, but you don't want to hear the truth. You don't want to know the truth. So, verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. God will never lead you to places in your life where he wants you to be dishonest. Not walking in craftiness. Not walking in, in um, not trying to be cunning with people. Or not trying to, to, we don't use fables to teach the truth. We teach the truth. Give them the truth. Give people the truth. Give yourself the truth. Now verse uh, 20, 21. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, and if you are in Jesus, then you will know the truth. Verse 22, that you put off, this is what I have up on the screen, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. The old man was a liar. Let the liar die. You put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to, and this is what I have underlined, deceitful lusts. The title of this, something related, I don't know exactly what to call it, but your sin lied to you. Your sin lied to you. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true, underline that word because it's in contradiction to the sin, true holiness. So you have a contrast here. Deceitful lusts, true holiness. Let's pray. You have to add, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel good. And, they went, and I don't know how to preach this morning, to be honest with you. Because I think that I'm relying too much on me and not on the Lord. So pray for me this morning. Father, I need your help. I mean it. I had nothing to say, nothing to give these people. And Father, if truth be told, I guess I'd rather be sick preaching than to feel good. Because I care about these people. I care about their lives. I care about their families. I care about the things going on in their life, Lord. And I know just how rotten the devil is. I know it. And I know, Father, what is in every one of us. Starting with me. Starting with me. I know what's in all of us and it's not good. I've lied before. I've lied to protect me. I've lied to protect others. And I'm not happy about that. I'm not okay with that. God have mercy on us. And Lord, you, you did not tell us that we had to go ringing a bell telling everybody in the world everything we've ever done wrong. But you did say you desire truth on the inward parts. At least, God, to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with you, and then to live honestly in the sight of all men. Because we are supposed to be the epistle of God, 
known of men. And Father, I want my life to be that way. I want my family to be that way. I want this church to be that way. To where we don't have anything to hide. So Father, teach us the truth. Teach us to walk in truth and to live truthfully. At least with you and with ourselves. Remind us the lies that sin told us. Remind us of that. And just help me preach. You don't have to preach long, God. Just help me do it. I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Now turn to Hebrews 3. Could be one of those messages. I just read scripture and go sit down. Let God work it in you. I want you to think about what I mean, or what actually what the Bible means by this. There in Ephesians 4, he called them deceitful lusts. Here in Hebrews 3, he's going to say the deceitfulness of sin. And I want you to pay attention to that. Verse 7 of Hebrews 3, let's back up a little bit, get the context. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Let me ask you a question. Can we get hardened to sin? And what I mean by that is, we just do it so much that we just don't think about it and it doesn't bother us anymore. I mean, when I spent three years in Bible college, I wasn't supposed to do this, but I snuck off to watch a movie one time. We weren't allowed to go see movies when I was in Bible college. And of all the ones I picked, Platoon. And I'm sitting there going, oh, it was, I mean, I'm not kidding, it was bad. It was, it was filthy. The land, of course, that's war. That's men at war. And so it was probably pretty close to being true. But it bothered me that my head just got stuffed with all that stuff. It bothered me. Just young man, it bothered me. How easily we can go from that offending us to being in an environment or putting ourselves in a place to where we just get used to it. And then we start doing it. That's what I'm talking about. That's the deceitfulness of sin. It gets you after... The Bible has this theme called vexation. Okay? You know what that is? Fingernails on a chalkboard. You are, you are see the looks I get. People... The first second ain't too bad, but after about 15 seconds of it, or kids making noise. And the older I get, can't handle it. It vexes us. It just pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds until we do something. Give in to it, get away from it, or whatever. Lot was vexed with Sodom. Probably a part of him had got used to it. And that's where it gets dangerous. That's the deceitfulness that sin always, it, tell, it gets us to accept as normal things that are not right. So he said, verse 8, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said... They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren. Who's he preaching to? Church people. Take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 
you should have some kind of fear in you that you do not want to lose God. It should be there. Because if it ain't, it ain't right. Now, I'm not saying to think that you're constantly hanging on a bare thread of salvation and God's just waiting to cut you off at any moment. I don't believe that. But to have a legitimate, healthy fear that you can get so used to sin that you, it doesn't bother you anymore. That's the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 13, this is why we have church. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Did you not need to be here today? I did. As good as I feel. As good as I feel. You think, well, I don't, I don't need too much church today. Don't need a whole lot of Bible. Don't need a whole lot of prayer. I think I'll be okay. That's the danger time. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There he said it. Harden not your hearts. So how did, how did Israel go from leaving Egypt to rotting in the wilderness, never making it into the promised land. Their heart got hardened because of their own personal sin. It wasn't that God was having them stop off in villages and towns where sinners were everywhere. God had them all to himself in the wilderness, separated out from everybody else. And don't give me this nonsense that... If we just separate out, we won't have any sin problems anymore. There's a drug problem in the Mennonite communities. You know that? Serious. Oh my goodness. There was an article come out the other day on this. I've known about this for years. Serious, serious drug issues in Amish and Mennonite communities. That are supposed to be separated from the rest of the world. They're not. Sin always finds a way to come back in. Do Have we not learned that yet? Same old sins that we said we don't want to do anymore. Same old stuff. Oh, the devil. Snakes always can get in. They can always get in. That's part of the deceitfulness. The deceitfulness says, well, I'm done with that sin. I'll never do that again as long as I live. That's the deceitfulness. That's part of it. Saying it'll never happen again, saying it'll never occur again, saying it'll never come back on you again. That's part of the deceitfulness. The other part's getting used, getting used to what other people are doing or getting used to what yourself are doing. Or I'll even say it like this. Paul said it this way. We condemn ourselves in the things that we allow. You say this is, oh, I don't believe in that. This is wrong. And yet you allow it. To go on in your presence. Or you allow it to go on in your home. Or you allow it to go on in your family. That is just as wrong as doing it. That's part of the lie that sin tells. And it'll lie to you every time. Who's the father of lies? The devil. What did he introduce into the world? Sin. He convinced Eve. That it was, listen to this, he convinced Eve that it was okay to disobey God. And it'll be alright. And so this is the result of it. Her firstborn son slew her secondborn son. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if. Underline that word, if. In that verse, underline that word, if. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast how long? You can leave Egypt, not make it home. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. 
Uh, turn to uh, Mark chapter 4. I don't have this in my notes here, but turn to Mark chapter 4. Here's another, another way of saying it. Another, here's another way of illustrating it. The parable of the seed and the sower. This to me spells out who's saved and who isn't. We know the stony, we know the wayside are all the people that we try to minister to that will never listen, they'll never hear it. We know they're going to hell. It's sad, but it's true. They're going, and there's no stopping it. You've preached to them, you've witnessed to them, you gave them tracts, you gave them scripture, gave them a card with a verse in it, whatever. You tried some way of getting the gospel to them. They're not, they throw it away. They've got so much sin in their life that it's gone. As soon as the word hits them, it's gone. They've got so many devils in their life, they just consume the word and it's gone. Number one. Number two, you have the stony ground people. These are the people who know it all. They know it all. They cannot be told any different. And they've already got in their mind what part of God or what part of the Bible is right and what part is not right. And while they say they believe God, they accept parts of the scripture as being okay, but other parts as not being okay or not accepting them as truth. And they've already set up in their mind how the devil is going to harden their hearts because something's going to be said, something's going to be preached. They don't like it. They don't want to hear it. They're not willing to stand for it. They, and, they're, and they're out and they're gone. And they bear no fruit. They're going to hell. But then the third group. Verse, um, verse 18. These are they which are sown among thorns. Thorns are always a type of sin. The sting of death is sin. The Bible says thorns sting. So thorns are always a type of devils, sin, sins in your life. I was talking to somebody this morning. And they said, you know what? Realize one day I got a thorn in my flesh. If you're going to be honest, so do you. And if God loves you enough, he won't let you ignore that. He won't let you ignore it. I can't, I don't want this in my life. I don't want it. I, there's something I want more than I want anything else in this world. And that is to not go to hell. So, the thorns, verse 18, such as hear the word. And he lists three things, the cares of this world. It means you got a worldly attitude, a worldly mindset, worldly mind. Everything about you, you are more concerned with enjoying this world than you are living for God. God is second or third or any other place other than first in your life. And this world and what pleases you and what satisfies you and what brings you joy or happiness, whatever it is, that comes first in your life. That is a setup and it's a thorn. And then he said the deceitfulness of riches. You know, that could be money, that could be riches in how things are going in life, or the, you could be rich in sin. But it's a lie, it's a deceit. And the lust of other things, he, he links all of these things together. Your lust. That I, I was with a man when I was in Bible college out in Oklahoma. This man had a wife. He had, he had two daughters, young, young family. Here I'm this Bible college student. And we're planning things for the, I don't know, we're doing some kind of Sunday school get together for the church. And they sent me and him out to go get soda and chips. So I'm riding in the man's car and and he, I liked him and because we had computers in, as a common interest. And this teenage girl walked down the street. He'd pass her by. He'd be staring at her. After a while, he caught on that I was, you know, I'm watching him. He's going, I believe it's okay to window shop as long as I buy at home. I'm 19 years old and full of hormones and I knew that was wrong. That's the lie. That's the lie. It'll tell you 
that you can play in the area of sin, but it won't affect you. That you can, you can have relationships with people that are living in sin and it won't affect you. This is why we were always told, Lisa and I were always told when we were growing up here in church, when you pick somebody to go out with, make sure that they believe what you believe. Because the Bible said, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is what we were taught. And it's not wrong. I can't preach down to anybody today as if I know this and I've never done it because I have. What I'm doing is I'm telling you, I know that sin lies because I believed it. We believe that we can be on the devil's side and God's side. We believe we can participate in what the world participates in and not come out of it. Here's a, here's a more dangerous one. A more dangerous one is we can believe that after I sin, God will always forgive me. So what we just did wrote ourselves a permission slip and signed God's name to it and said, you can do this. That's the deceitfulness I'm talking about. And then after a while, here's what happens. All of a sudden now, you don't believe what you used to believe. You think that there are preachers in this world who no longer preach against certain sins because they don't believe they're wrong anymore? You believe there's preachers that drink alcohol and think nothing of it because they don't think it's wrong? Where did they get that from? Did they read that in the Bible somewhere? No, they did it so much that they just decided, see, there's, they believed the lie that their sin repeatedly told them, do this and it's okay, do this and it's okay, do this and it's okay. You believe there are church people who think the same way. This is what I do, I've been doing it for years. I, 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 don't, see, I don't see that God has a problem with it. Or I don't think God says there's anything wrong with this. Or in some cases, just blatantly ignore what the Bible says. Like, going to go get a tattoo. Can I go get a tattoo? Why not? God said don't to. So if I do it, knowing that God said don't do it, is that... That's the lie. That's the lie. And let me say this. When we believe the lie that our sin is not a sin, you won't repent because you didn't do it wrong. Now where are you? Now you're not asking for forgiveness because... You believe the lie that you didn't do anything wrong. These are dangerous places to be. I've been there. And so is a bunch of other people sitting here and online. We've told ourselves, we believe the lies that we can do this, it's okay, or we can do this, and I'll ask forgiveness later. I'd rather ask forgiveness than permission. I've heard people say that. Turn to Isaiah 28, and I'm going to let you go. Well, 
Turn to Isaiah 8. Let me preach it a while. Then I'll let you go. Let me say it right. Maybe this message would have been better if I was still sick and cranky and mean. And, but it is what it is. Look, some of you sitting here, you're sitting in a room full of people that have been down this road before, where they believed the lies that their sin told them. They've been down this road. They would come up here and say to you, listen to what, listen to what God's trying to say here. Because I fell for it and I, I lost everything or almost lost everything or I will never do that or whatever. They would stand here. We could drag people up from hell and bring them here and they would tell you, listen to what God said. And it doesn't matter what sin it is. That it does not matter what sin it is. They're all going to tell you the same lie. And then we use those lies to cover it up. Isaiah 28, 14. Hear the word of the Lord now. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we at agreement? Man, there's so many ways to preach that. One, one of the ways is for the guy to say, like he said to me years ago, I believe my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. I got my own deal worked out with God. I'm fine. He later repented of that. Thank God. So we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. So when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. Let me ask you a question. What is a scourge used for? It's a whip. So when we see God coming to chastise us, we will say, I didn't do anything wrong. And then when you do that, you're a bastard. And you're not going to heaven. When you won't let God whip you and whatever reason you put behind it. But one of the reasons is because you think you didn't do anything wrong or you were justified in what you were doing, or whatever. You just, you told God, don't touch me with that scourge. I didn't do anything wrong. Melissa, can you imagine turning around to our mom and saying, you're not whipping me today, mom. Did you really? You mean that broom she was flying on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whipped you with a broom, huh? Yeah, that sounds like her. You didn't say that twice, did you? No. So look at this. When the old flooring scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And I have regrets to this day. I have, I have regrets to this day about lies I told when I was 16 years old. And why did I lie? I lied so that I wouldn't get in trouble. I'll just, I'll give you, a, I won't give you the bad stuff on me. I'll just give you the little stuff on me. I was with a group of kids in this school band with the Honor Society. We were putting on a dinner for the PTA. 
and we found out the room that they kept all the school concessions in was unlocked, Phil. So somebody found it out. They were in there pulling candy bars out. And then one after another, we all ended up going in the room, putting candy bars and chips and stuff in our pockets. One guy filled his trumpet case full of candy bars. <laughs> well, we didn't know that the Honor Society did it too. The Honor Society did it too. So, the next day in band class, Mr. Rowland, our band director, is going, I got something serious. There was a bunch of stuff stolen. A lot of stuff stolen. I took two candy bars. Ate one, and then on the way home, I threw the other one out the window because I felt guilty. That's all I did. We're talking, back then, we're talking 50 cents worth of candy. And when that band director looked us in the eye and he said, it was either the Honor Society or my band, and he said, I told the principal our band would not do something like that. And I just flushed. I spent a year wanting to go tell what I did. And to this day, I regret it. You know what Reg Kelly said to me? You ought to go back over there with a box of candy bars and pay them back. Reg, I don't want to hear that. Now that's something that doesn't amount to a hill of beans, but it's wrong. And I believed the lie that I could do it and it was okay. And I'm sure with all of us, there's been far worse things. Far worse things. That we lied to cover it up. That's what that means. We've made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now, what are we supposed to be covered with? The blood. That's how, we're, that's how our sins, all of us have got them, right? So we're all supposed to have our sins covered, not with our lies and our cover-ups. That's Hillary Clinton stuff. Bloomberg's a dead man. If she ever becomes vice president, he better get a food taster. Guarantee you she's aiming for the White House. Because she's back in. Did you hear that? Bloomberg's floating her name now to be vi vice president. She's back in. And her and her husband have a string of stuff that they've covered up over the years. Long lines of things that they've done. Terrible things. We're not supposed to be them. We're not supposed to be Ahab and Jezebel. But that's what you did. You told a lie instead of telling the truth to cover it up. Why? Pride. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment will I also lay to the line. By the way, look at that picture. What does that represent? Tell me what that picture is saying. It was him. It was, it was Captain Peacock in the kitchen with the knife. Okay? I, I said this last Sunday, I'm not going to repeat it much, but we point fingers at everybody else, and usually the person doing that the loudest, they're the ones should have the scarlet letter on their chest. What does that represent? Gravity doesn't tell lies. You know, and we've known about that since Egypt. We've known that a plumb bob on the end of a line will never never lie about what is straight you know why because god is the one who made the law of gravity you know what i just said god's laws never lie i'm not going to preach all that but that's what he means i will lay judgment also will i lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet i would to god that every judge in america 
would actually follow the law. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. I, all, I'm, all I'm going to say to you is this, and I'm going to let you go. When you build a refuge, a cover of lies, be sure your sin will find you out. Because at least in my conscience, in my conscience, to this day, I'm paying for lies that I told a long time ago. And the candy bar was just a little, little piece of it. I wish I'd never lied. I wish I'd never lied to my mom and dad. I wish I'd never lied to the school. I wish I'd never lied to my wife. I wish I'd never lied to my children. I wish I'd never lied to my friends. I wish I'd never lied to God. Yeah, God is forgiven. But in my conscience... I still bear the marks. They always say, well, if you can live with it, so can I. Sometimes I don't live with it all that well. I'm saying this to you to get you to avoid the pain of covering up sin with lies. It hurts, and it hurts for a long, long time. Let's bow our heads.